Good morning. This is the service for January 31st. And I welcome you here to this worship time. My name is Chris Smits. Most of you will know me because I attend this church, but some of you may not know me because you are viewing this broadcast. I attend this church. I'm a retired teacher, and before becoming a teacher, I actually was a minister for a few years. So it is my privilege to lead you in worship today. There are no announcements that come to mind at this point. So I ask you now to just quiet your heart before God as you listen as David plays the prelude. Let us now pray. O oh God, as we gather together, we thank you for the faith of those who over the centuries have passed on the faith. We know we are here today by your grace and also because of the faithfulness of those who have gone before us. May we also transmit the faith in unsullied and undimmed witness to those who follow, may come to know you and your will. Fortify us with the true faith as we draw inspiration and incentive to be faithful in our time. Amen. Dear God, you are a loving, gracious God. You've offered us forgiveness and the gift of new life in you. Thank you that your love is perfect, it never fails, and that nothing can separate us from your love. We pray that our lives would be filled and overflowing with the power of your love so we can make a difference in this world and bring honor to you. We ask for your help in reminding us that the most important things are not what we do outwardly, not based on any talent or gift. But the most significant thing we can do in this life is simply to love you and to choose to love others. Lord, thank you that your love is patient. Help us show patience with those around us. Lord, thank you that your love is kind. Help us to extend kindness to others. Lord, thank you that true love is not jealous. Help us cast aside feelings of jealousy or hatred towards others. And now let us sing hymn number 330, Jesus Shall Reign. Hello. You'll remember last week, before we sang the first hymn, we wanted to talk a little bit about its history. So I thought I'd do that this week again. We're going to be singing Jesus Shall Reign. It's a great hymn, but again, do we know very much about it? This hymn was written by Isaac Watts in 1719. 
Now Watts has been referred to as the father of modern English hymns. He's written a tremendous number of hymns, and I'm sure as you're paging through the hymn book, you'll see his name fairly frequently. It was originally titled Christ's Kingdom Among the Gentiles, which in part is Watts' translation of the second part of Psalm 72. So as you're looking at this hymn, you may want to refer to Psalm 72. This hymn is often used as a missionary hymn. And I think that the most dramatic use of this hymn was back in 1862 in one of the South Seas Islands. They used this hymn during a ceremony where they were converting the, the islanders from cannibalism to Christianity, which I found really interesting. And again, as you sing this song, think of the words Think what they mean to you. There's no sense in me telling you what they mean to me, because I think each and every person will gather a different meaning from the words. What's important is that we think about the words as we sing them. So let's sing together, Jesus Shall Reign. Thank you, David, for that playing of that wonderful hymn, as well as a great introduction to it. Let us again pray. Lord, open our eyes and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The first scripture reading is from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Gracious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. 
He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the land of their nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are steadfast forever and ever, done in faithfulness and uprightness. He provides redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. And now our second scripture reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. Jesus went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out to him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. May God bless the reading of his word and bring joy to us this day. The divine authority in Jesus. When David asked me last week to cover a couple of messages, I willingly said yes, but then had to think about what I should speak on. I do not have a collection of sermons on the shelf, and I don't have a number of ideas written down about some burning topic. As a teacher, I would go back to the curriculum documents to give me direction to what to teach. Therefore, I looked at the lectionary, a detailed plan of biblical texts to be read over four years that is used by many ministers for direction. Today's message is based on the texts suggested by the lectionary. I will try to give you the context or background, look carefully at key highlights, and tell you what it suggests, how I should apply it or learn from it. Hopefully, this will be helpful to you in your life. As we think about the New Testament passage, we should keep in mind the Old Testament text. The psalmist praises God for the provision of food as he did the manna in the desert and the bestowal of land as the Israelites took over the land of Canaan. God truly was faithful and just throughout the Old Testament, but not only in the past, but in the present and the future. As one reads the Old Testament, we can break it down into three main sections. The first five books as the time of Moses. Next are those of the judges and the kings that were the leaders and spokesmen of God. And the last are the prophets who God rose up to speak. And then there are no more texts. There is a silence for 400 years. No message from God worth recording was received. Israelites were a meager nation from their past glory. The king was chosen and was under the authority of a foreign nation. The Israelites didn't have much authority. The religious leaders were the priests 
and the teachers of the law. And the majority of them saw their lives as one of privilege, not of divine service. Among the common people, there was a hope for deliverance, to see a demonstration of God's power and favor, to be a sovereign nation under God once again. But there was little glory celebrated. Apathy was very evident. They felt defeated. Upon this stage, Jesus appears. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of a carpenter, had traveled to Jerusalem several times and also to the River Jordan, where he was baptized by John, who shortly after the baptism was arrested and imprisoned. This prompted Jesus to not go to the capital of Jerusalem, but to a small town on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, which was actually near his hometown. This was quite far away from the capital, where all the action was and the influence was where he began his ministry. The story we read about in Mark details the first major event in Jesus' ministry, cleansing the evil spirit from the demonic in the synagogue in Capernaum. This was an astonishing, electrifying event. And here we see the fundamental principles and power of Jesus' ministry. Note with me the key facts of the event. First of all, Jesus taught the people. Then they noted that it was a new teaching. It was dynamic. They were impressed that Jesus taught them with an authority unlike the teachers of the law. He spoke the truth clearly and he illuminated the scriptures so that the audience understood. He was careful, precise and concise and very caring and compassionate as he spoke. Jesus spoke of the glory of God, hope renewed and the love of God. And he would over and over again over the next three years of his ministry, do the same. The people were hopeful and mesmerized as the message was not only about God's faithfulness to the old, but a message of love in a dynamic new covenant. Secondly, Jesus commanded the evil spirit and they obeyed and the demonic was healed. The power to heal the spiritually ill belonged to Jesus. He had the divine authority to heal whoever, whenever. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he would preach and teach his unique message and heal the sick and the demonic. He brought healing of the body, mind, and spirit. He healed the divine human relationship. Third, Jesus healed the demonic on the Sabbath. Wow! What a way to truly demonstrate his divine authority, to act on a sacred day. He was called the Holy One of God. He demonstrated an authority over evil never seen before. He was not just an ordinary run-of-the-mill priest or prophet or even king, but one that was unique and showed the glory of God. The people were truly impressed and gave praise to God, except for the religious leaders. When they heard, they were very sorely vexed. This was not something they would forgive or forget. Three years later, this would be part of their argument of condemnation that would lead to his crucifixion. But most people were positively impressed and spread the news. This was before the time of the internet. So 
all through Galilee quickly means it took weeks, months. The news did spread far and wide about this very unique individual who demonstrated such great power and wisdom. As I think about what I can learn from this and how I should apply the lesson to my life, I want to refocus on the healing of the demonic. As we think of the demonic, two images or interpretation come to mind. One is exorcism, and two, mental illness. Both seem pertinent and valid. There are cases of possession which are extremely rare, which the text seems relating to. But this has little, if any, application to most of us. Some mental illness have behavioral complications that lead to criminal acts. I think of the individual who drove a van into a crowd of pedestrians on the sidewalk in Toronto. There are many penitentiary inmates that have mental illness or disorders that need treatment and medication. And then there are those individuals who have no mental illness but act very evil, such as a mass murderer. Each of these extreme needs serious intervention beyond personal care that we can give. There are also many individuals with some mental illness or disorder who are not violent, needing our love, care, and attention. Many homeless deal with some illness. They need our attention as a society and church. Many years ago, I attended an indigenous service in Regina, where the speaker talked about the story of the black and the white wolf, and how we need to feed and care for the white wolf so that it does not get devoured by the black wolf. This brings me to my personal application. In this world, we are inundated with messages of darkness, and those around us can influence us toward that but we are called to be light. Personally, I like fantasy, science fiction, and scary stories. And much of it is pure make-belief and very entertaining, but some is very gruesome, realistic, and in the realm of possibility. Some take too long for the hero to get revenge over the evil one. Some leave you in scary, dark thoughts. And I need to be more sensitive and not saturate myself with those dark stories and movies. But may I take more time to feed on and think about what is good and beautiful. We need to think about how can we strive to overcome evil to be good, to be loving and kind to those who struggle with mental illness and other disorders. Jesus proved himself to be the Holy One of God. He is our Lord and Savior and healer. And he beckons us to a whole life in him. He calls us friends, the Lord of lords, King of kings, befriends us. So let us go forth in his name. Let us now sing hymn number 213, Rejoice the Lord is King from Voices United.
Let us now bring our concerns to our God as we pray. Let us pray. Creator God, who sees all and knows all, we come to you to confess what you already know, that we do not have all the answers that we so desperately long for in order to free our world from poverty, pain, and injustice. But we are spending ourselves on loving you and serving the orphan, the widow, and the stranger. And so we ask, in your mercy, that you would fill us again for the work ahead. Build us up in love, that we might pour ourselves out again and again, to build what counts and lasts forever, justice, peace, and freedom, and to make it known that you are love, and that you give love, and that you require love in return. Amen. And now let us sing hymn number 589, Lord, Speak to Me, out of Voices United. As we conclude our worship time together, here is a bl blessing written for our current pandemic season. It comes from Emily Swan and Ken Wilson of Solace Jesus. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted, honor everyone, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with, among you and remain with you always. Amen. And now David will play the postlude. Amen. 